Good morning, everybody. Madison, I felt pressure when you were talking because you said it's been a great Sunday so far. (laughs) What did you mean by that? I don't want to blow it. Let's make it a whole great Sunday. (laughs) Last week we started Philippians and we didn't even turn to the book of Philippians. We turned to the book of Acts because the Philippian church started in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, and so today we're actually going to get into the book of Philippians. You might remember Philippians is written from where? The beach side. It's written from a condo in Hawaii. Where is it written from? Jail. It's written from jail. And uh, if you know the story, Paul's been put in jail for the gospel, but lest you just think he's some guy that's so unapproachable and so holy You should know that before he was Paul, he was Saul, and uh, he was persecuting Christians so much so that he was the one that was holding the coats for the guys that stoned the first martyr, Stephen. And when he had his conversion on the Damascus Road, he actually had letters with him to persecute more Christians. So it's a letter from prison, and I uh, thought I'd let you know I've been writing a prisoner. This is a guy that was, um, when I came to the last church I pastored in Illinois, he had already grown up, and I saw him a few times, but he was already sort of drifting from the church at that point. But he'd grown up in the church, and uh, then he committed a, a, a very a bad crime. And I've been, I just felt led about a, a six months ago, maybe, that I needed to write him. His parents I knew very well, and his parents meant a lot to me. But I just felt led to write him, and so I wrote him, and he was just shocked to hear from me. And then he wrote me back, and he told me about his conversion on December, in December of 2019 in prison. And so I told him I was preaching on Philippians, and he's got nothing but time. I said, if you got time to do some research for me, you know, you can uh, actually do some study and send me some stuff that you're finding. Uh, He does a lot of research while he's in there in prison. But I said, maybe just to kind of introduce yourself, why don't you just write our church and tell them about you. So this is from my friend Keith Riches, and he writes, I woke this morning to the sound of a hundred toilets flushing. Soon after, the voices associated with those flushes began to talk, argue, shout, and in some cases scream. Uh, in In my home, space is at a premium. The meager measurement of the place is only uh, eight feet by five feet. Add in that a stool, a sink, a desk, a bunk bed, and another man, and quarters are very tight. But life for me wasn't always this way. I was raised by loving parents in a Christian home. My elementary years were spent in a private Christian school attending church as I grew I became active in my church youth group, participating occasionally in service as a soloist, soaked up the things of the Lord. As a grown man, I joined the army, and after completing my time in service, got married, landed a good job, lived happily for many years. But all the while, I was growing further and further from my walk with the Lord to the point it became non-existent. Eventually, I lost my wife, my job, my home, all due to alcoholism, which had consumed me. At age 40, at Rock Baden, I committed for some unknown, uh, for for reasons unknown, a horrible crime for which I was sentenced to natural life in prison. I don't know if I had wandered so far from Christ that one of Satan's demons took control of me for a brief time, or if I was so mentally impaired by my drinking that I had no control of my actions. I had no criminal background or experience with incarceration, so the reality of prison life was shocking. I was surrounded by the vilest forms of humanity, facing a life sentence, had no hope for the future, no hope that God would have anything to do with me. Along came an unexpected letter from my childhood pastor, that was the pastor there before me, who was concerned about me in general, uh, but specifically for my spiritual well-being. I told him I had all but lost my faith in God and doubted that he was concerned with the likes of me. And the pastor immediately sent me a Bible, and we began corresponding and speaking on the phone regularly. He encouraged me to study the Bible anew and reminded me of truths I had buried deep in my heart. I began to pray again, and what I discovered was that God had not forsaken me. Someone needs to hear that today. 
God has not forsaken you. The reverse was true. And so on December 9th, 2019, I rededicated my life to the Lord. I found hope and a reason to live in Christ's loving hands. I found in myself a burning desire to study the Bible and learn all I could about the ways of the Lord and the type of Christian he wants us to be. Today I have several translations of the Bible and a good amount of commentary material to study and devote part of every day to serious study of the Word of God. Given the fact of normally being locked in my cell all day, I have little chance to mingle with others, but I wear a Christian cross around my neck, always have a Bible sitting on the desk by the door where any passerbys can see. I try to be a witness by my words and actions. There's no doubt in my mind that the Lord is preparing me for use in some way. He's already using me in subtle ways as a witness, and I hope a light in this dark place. I wonder what he may have in mind as I eventually move to a medium security institution where more movement will be allowed. My message to you, church, is that no matter how low you have fallen or how dire your circumstances might be, God is always there. He will help you and give you strength and courage if you will let him. If Christ was ever in your heart, he remains there. If you have strayed, he's right there for you to find. If I, if I can give thanks and praise to God for my prison cell, perhaps you can do the same in your situation. I encourage you to try. Blessings, Keith Richardson. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If any of you feel led to, to write him, I'll be glad to give you his letter. I think it would be great uh, to just encourage Keith. Uh, the crime he committed, he, he murdered his parents, uh, actually. So the dear friends of mine. Uh, and um, obviously has great remorse for that. But God, how many know that God can forgive anything and anybody? Amen. This morning, we're going to begin with Philippians, and Philippians chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter one verses 1 through 11. And I'm calling it Rejoicing in Harmony. This is the letter of joy. You'll find joy all the way through. Harmony, harmony, if, if we just all uh, sang that note, that would be, we're all. Uh, you sing that with me if you if you can sing ah, that's unison but now one can the, can uh, some of you sing ah, and some of you sing ah. some are not being allowed to sing I see that one three five can someone sing ah okay so let's have ah That's harmony, right? Harmony doesn't mean we're all singing the same thing, but it means what we're singing sounds good together. How many know that we can be brothers and sisters without being twins? But we can sound good together. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul and Timothy. Remember last year we last week we learned that Timothy went with him on when he started the church in Philippi. Slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Okay, the first thing that I want to teach us this morning is that if we are going to live in harmony, it's important that we think of ourselves as servants and others as special. Think of yourselves. Isn't it interesting? It's kind of interesting to see the progression of the Apostle Paul in his writings. In some of Paul's earliest writings, he calls himself an apostle. And now he's getting toward the end of his life and he calls himself a slave. In the beginning, he's an apostle. By the end, he says, I don't need the titles. I'm just a slave of Jesus Christ. But he refers to the people he's writing to as God's holy people. Let me just tell you that in marriage or in ministry or in life, if you want to be in harmony, think of others as better than yourselves. How many know that our married know that marriage is not a 50-50 proposition, it's 100-100, right? It's about honoring the other person and putting them before yourselves. Next week's Father's Day. I promise I am not going to be teaching on the verse that says, 
Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, all right? You know, there are a lot of men that like that verse. They put it on their little tool shelf, you know. But what they miss is that verse immediately follows the scripture that says, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence to Christ. And then he says, wives, submit to your husbands. But then he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for them. If you want to live in harmony, it's important that we think of others better than ourselves. Romans 12, 10, my mother drilled this into us when we were kids. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Really important if you want to, if you want to live in harmony. It's not about what I can have, what I can get, what, what, what's in it for me. But it's about putting others important. It's such an important key. It's interesting. He almost says the bishops and deacons as an afterthought. He says to God's holy, holy people and the bishops and deacons. You know, I think in our day, we, we put the bishops and deacons first, right? Oh, we want to make sure that we kiss the ring, you know, of everybody that we think is important or whatever. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says to God's holy people. He's talking to the congregation at Philippi. You guys are amazing. You are God's holy people and the bishops and deacons. Let me just tell you something I've learned in life. What makes great churches, I shouldn't tell you this, it's not great pastors. What makes great churches is great people. I know some great pastors that pastor some very average Churches, I'm a very average pastor, but I pastor a great church. Amen. Because we have great people. We have great people in this church. And, and so he says, to God's holy people, think of yourselves as servants and others as special. It's interesting to me that he calls himself slaves. Slavery... And there's a lot of discussion about that. There's people that argue, the Bible, the Bible defends slavery. The Bible doesn't defend slavery. Let, let me just be clear. And Christian, and we at Life Church do not defend slavery, amen? Amen. We're, we're not, chattel slavery was like the worst of all human conditions because it's forced. People are looked at as property. And so those scriptures where, where the Apostle Paul talks about how masters should treat their slaves and slaves their masters, he's not talking about how things ought to be. He's talking about how things are. They're living in a system where it exists. And he's talking in that system that exists. Here's how masters ought to act. Here's how slaves ought to act. But the liberation of the gospel is about changing that. And by the way, slavery, slavery was, was, was eradicated primarily because of Christians. They took a stand and said that, that, that we can't allow it. However, when one was a slave and they were uh, given their release in the Bible, in the Old Testament, if they, if, if, if they decided that they loved that master so much, they could say, you know what, this guy was great. And I want to work for him for the rest of my life. And they would pierce their ear. And they would become, they would become a love slave, a love servant. What Paul and Timothy are describing themselves as, as love slaves of Jesus Christ. In other words, in other words what, what, what you're saying when you're saying you're a chosen slave, you're saying this, I trust the master more than I even trust myself. How many believe that God can do a better job with my life than I can do with my life? Amen. That Jesus' plans for my life are even greater than my plans for my life. And so I'm going to give, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, that'll be a song, let Jesus take the wheel. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it, I'm going to give Jesus control of my life because he can do life better than I can. And so Paul uh, and Timothy call themselves slaves of Jesus Christ. We teach in our class, in our newcomers class, that every member is a minister. That we don't have like, like preferred parking for the pastors. Sometimes I park up front. Can I just tell you why I park up front? I, it's not because I'm the pastor. The reason I park up front, I'm going to let you know a little secret. 
is the garbage cans are up front. And my wife says, please park in front of those garbage cans so no one can see those when they pull into the church with all that garbage flowing outside. So if you see me up front, it's not because I'm, it's because I'm trying to block the garbage cans. <laughs> True story. But then he, said, he calls them God's holy people. Isn't that really interesting? Some translations call them saints, to God's saints. This becomes really interesting because in some churches or in some traditions, saints are sort of like super Christians, like superhero Christians. How many know what I'm talking about? You know, like, like you got to be, there's, there's like regular Christians. By the way, I don't think the New Testament understands the whole concept of cultural Christians that you're just a Christian because you're born in America, or maybe even that you walked the aisle one time or you gave your life to Jesus Christ. You know, in, in Iran today, where, where there's a great revival going on and people are becoming Christians, there's no cultural Christians over there because if you become a Christian in Iran, it might cost you your life. So there's no cultural Christians. Even in the New Testament, you are open to persecution. And so there's this whole idea of cultural Christianity is not there. And he describes them as God's holy people, that you are saints. Now, in some churches, you know, uh, I know in the Catholic Church, there's a process you go through to, to sainthood. So when you die, if the Pope thinks that you've lived a worthy life, you are considered venerable. You've gotten through the first hoop. And then if someone can verify that, there was a miracle that happened under your ministry, then you are beatified or you're considered blessed. And then if you've had two miracles, then you can become a saint. Can I just say, if God performs any miracles under my ministry, it will not be because of, of the goodness of Phil Nordstrom. It will be because of the goodness of God. And I've seen God do amazing things but don't ever give any glory to the people that are there when it happens. The glory all goes to God. I'm in a conversation with a friend who, um, who's become very enamored with the liturgical church. And I have, a, I have an appreciation for the liturgical church. But, but it's trying to decide who his patron saint is, the idea of of a, of a saint that, and as, as you read about it and study, you literally can pray to these saints. And I think there's something in us that's always looking for something. There's got to be something more than really just Jesus. But, but the scripture says there is one mediator between God and man, and it is the man, Jesus Christ. I think there's a psychological reason that we want these super Christians, that we want these Super saints, so to speak. I think psychologically, we all have need for heroes, right? I mean, I think, that, I think that's the good side of what, what, what the whole sainthood thing is all about. We all need heroes, and I think it's really important that we have people in the church, both present and past, that we can look up to, and I think that's very important. There's a, there's a psychological need for heroes, but I think there's something even more subtle there. I think there's a subtle thing to put ourselves down, like, no way am I a saint. I'm not a saint, I'm an ain't. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, and, and the Apostle Paul calls these ordinary people saints. From the scriptural perspective, you already, when Jesus saved you, you're a saint. If you got the guts to, turn to your neighbor and say, you're a saint. You're a saint, Right. The scripture says this about you. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When you pass from death to life, you became a saint of Jesus Christ. These are not simply people who have been baptized and show up on Sunday, or maybe they, they, they give their tithes. That's, he's not talking about cultural Christianity. He's talking about people that are committed to living their lives and becoming more like Christ. That's the whole thing, amen, about being saints. Verse 3 says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to God 
whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Here's what Paul does, and here's what we should do. Give thanks to God for the people he brings to your mind. This week, I've been away in Houston, Texas at a a great conference that I went to. But while I was away, I was thinking about so many of you. I know Pat is suffering with a broken ankle right now, and as I prayed for Pat, I was made sure before I prayed for Pat that I just thanked God for Pat, because when I think of Pat, I think about all he does for the Lord, think of all of his wife does for the Lord, and, and I just, God, I just thank you for Pat, and then I prayed for his ankle and that God would bless him, and, and I know that Dan and Lisa Irwin have been going through a lot, and I've been thinking about them this week, but I was also thanking God for them, because I know that while they've been suffering, they've been bringing Pat food, and not cat food, Pat food, all right? Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, and they, they, they've been bringing, and so I just thank God for Dan and Linda before I prayed for Linda, who's, who's struggling with her knee. Ashley had a birthday this week, a surprise party here at the church, and I knew about it, couldn't be there, but I just thanked God for Ashley and what you and Mark mean uh, to the church. And Denise had a baby shower, and I couldn't be at, and I just hate to miss those baby showers. But anyway, uh, I, I, I just thank God for Denise. What a blessing she is to our congregation and to Emerald Youth. And I thought about the fact that Madison put on the shower for her, and I thanked God for Madison, which makes me think of David and all of that he does, and thank God for that. And I knew that Dan Rutherford was was uh, was uh, doing a lot of stuff around the church this week, doing odd jobs. And, man, what a blessing Dan and his wife Lisa have been to our church. And he's back there running the camera right now. And I just thank God uh, for them. And I knew that, you know, that uh, Chris Irwin's finishing his doctorate and working on that. And every time I think about Chris, I just thank God for his friendship and bringing him and Nisha, Nisha, who power washed my deck this week and made it look like a new deck. I just thank God uh, for Nisha. But, but, but just be thankful for, for the people that God brings to your mind. The next thing is there's joy in teamwork of sharing the good news. He says, you have been my partners from the beginning until now. We can't do ministry alone. We can't accomplish what God's called us to do alone. Madison's up there asking for volunteers. We're not looking for people to say, okay, I'll do it if you need people. I I hate it, but I'll do it. No, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for people to say, you know what? I don't even belong to myself. I've been bought with a price. God's been so good to me. And, And I'm good at that, and I would love to serve in that area. We can't do this without partners in the gospel. There's joy and teamwork. You have been my partners in the gospel. Four words could change your life. Never do ministry alone. Amen. Always have someone that you're mentoring, someone that you're beside. If you want to experience joy in ministry, never do ministry alone. And then here's the Here's the refrigerator verse or the t-shirt verse of the week that you see uh, it on magnets on refrigerators. Apostle Paul says, being confident of this, he who has begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus has begun a good work in you. It didn't say he's working on you. It didn't say that Jesus is working among you, but that Jesus is doing an internal work inside of you. When, when, you, when you got saved, you were infected with something. There, there was a holy virus that affected you. If you got the same salvation that I did, where the Apostle Paul said old things are passed away and all things are become new, when that happened, there was a virus that infected you and God began something in you. 
And that good work that he began in you, he's going to continue to do that and to carry that out until the day of Jesus Christ. He's working in you. He's not just trying to make, he's not trying to like reform your life. He's not trying to make Ben the best Ben that he can be. Jesus is on the inside of Ben. I, I like how John Wesley defines salvation. John Wesley defines salvation as the life of God in the soul of a man. It's having the life of God inside the soul of a man. We're, I'm confident that he that has begun this work in you, that God is something on the inside and it's working on the outside of me. Amen. That God's begun this good work in you. And Paul is confident. He's not confident in you. Paul's not confident in me. How many know we can disappoint ourselves time and time again? The confidence is not, I just know you're going to do it. You're just going to keep improving. You're just, you're just that kind of person. That's not what he says. He says, no, being confident that he who has begun a good work in you, God who began that good work in you, our confidence is not in our own consistency. Our confidence is in God. Amen. Amen. So that my friend Keith Richardson, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad he gets, no matter how bad life got, he said that that God that had done something for him earlier in his life, it was still there and it was working on him. And he said, if God was ever with you, he said in that letter, he won't leave you. Amen. God, aren't you glad that God won't leave you alone no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been? Amen. God began that good work. I used to wear a button that said P-B-P-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. Anyone know what that means? It means please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Please be patient. God's not finished with me yet. I'm a work in progress. I'm not everything that I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And he who began this good work in me is going to carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. This would be a great verse for us to memorize. Let's try it. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Until the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's really good news. Amen. He's not done with you. Our life, our life, did you know that when a rocket goes to the moon, it doesn't go straight to the moon? It overshoots it, goes off course, goes back, goes off course, and finally gets to the moon. It's called undulations. I don't know where you're at in your life without You may be in a dip right now. Don't lose heart. He who began a good work in you is going to carry it on to completion. My life hasn't been a, a straight line up and to the right. Has your life been that way? Straight line up and to the right? No. My life's been a, a series of undulations. But by God's grace, amen. I'm trending. Amen. I'm trending. The positive. No, I'm not trending. Does that what you said? My wife doesn't think I'm trending. You're thinking social media, you heathen. You're right. I'm not trending on social media. I am the definition of uncool. All right. <laughs> Verse 7. So it's right that I should feel as I do about you, for, I have a spe for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and how much I long for you with the tender compassion of Jesus Christ. This is super important. Express your love to those people in your life who have not been fair-weather friends. Paul says, you were with me when the church was going and blowing and growing in Philippi, but here I am in prison and you're still with me. You're sending me visitors while I'm in prison. You, you weren't just there in the good times, but you were there in the bad times. I, I mentioned I was at a conference this week, and it was such an encouraging conference. 
Sometimes you go to these conferences and pastors get up and tell you how they grew their church to a million and you're sitting there thinking, shut up. And anyway, um, but this pastor, and it was a large church, but he was talking about just what the last several years have been like to pastor. And he talked about pastoring. He talked about that Easter where their attendance was zero. Remember that? And he talked about that, and he talked about a, a guy in their church that it wasn't just, it wasn't just COVID. I, I mean, the, the devil had fun in the last couple of years. There were racial riots going on in the last couple of years. You remember the George Floyd thing that happened? And then the devil said, let's just have some more fun. Let's put a, uh, a presidential election right in the middle of it, huh? You remember those days? Everyone's just killing each other on social media. And this pastor was talking about all that, and he, he talked about a man that had been in his church for 30 years that quit the church, and he said he quit by email. He said, man, I've done their, like, their weddings and their baby dedications and all of that, and he quit the church by email, and he said, I couldn't possibly go to a church where somebody voted differently than me. I'm glad I pastor a church that it doesn't matter how you voted. Three people agree with me. <laughs> All the Democrats just said amen. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now we've got you identified. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't matter how you voted. Our unity and our harmony is not because we're identical in the way that we see things and all of that. But our unity is our partnership that we have in the gospel. Amen. Amen. Come on, that's good preaching anyhow. That's where our unity is. It's not about, and, 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 and he said something that just brought tears to my eyes. He said, during COVID, I learned, though, that I did not have a crowd. I had a church, and I had people that loved God. Can I just tell you what I learned during COVID about you? I learned during COVID you gave when you couldn't come. I didn't know how we would survive. Seriously, we can't meet? How are we going to do that? Did you see last week we gave financials of the last seven years? Did anyone notice that during the year of, of COVID that we continued to grow financially even when we had zero on Easter? What did I learn during those days? I learned that we had a church. I learned that Life Church, you're not in it for the loaves and fishes. You're not in it just for the good times. You're in it for the difficult times. Amen. And I just want to thank God for you, for those people in my life who've not been fair weather friends, but you've been with me when the church is going and blowing, and you've been with me when the devil's throwing everything he can and the kitchen sink at us, and you've been faithful. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Verse 9, I pray that your love will overflow more and more. You'll keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters. Well, this is going to be good. What really matters? What really matters is whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. No, what really matters is your views of the second coming, if you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture or the post-tribulation rapture or the mid-tribulation rapture. And some of you are thinking, I don't even know what you're talking about. And I say, thank God for that. Amen. <laughs> what really matters, that we take communion every Sunday or we use grape juice or we use wine? Do we do it every Sunday? Do we do it once a month? Are you a Calvinist or are you an Arminian? And if you don't know the difference, good. What really matters, whether we have church on Saturday or Sunday? What really matters, that we sing songs using a pipe organ from hymnals or we do it with guitars and drums up on a screen? Is that what really matters? No, what Paul said, here's what really matters. What really matters, that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ Jesus' return. Ooh, what should we be learning at Life Church? 
how to become so theologically sophisticated that we can argue with our friends of the other persuasion on Facebook? No. I want want to learn when we come together, how can I make it through this week and be more like Jesus? How can I be more pure and be more blameless? And I want to become that way more and more until the day of Christ's return. And then verse 11, he says, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. What's the fruit of your salvation? The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. The fruit of your salvation is not how smart you are theologically. The fruit of your salvation is the righteous character produced in your life, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. As you're taking notes, love is manifest by growing in grace and knowledge. By the way, I just want to, this is an aside. At the beginning, he he says to them, grace and peace. Grace was the, the Greek way of greeting when peace was the Jewish way, shalom. He's speaking to, to both the Greeks and the Jews that are there, grace and peace. Love is manifest by growing in grace and in knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of, knowledge of how smart theologically we can be. No, but knowledge that we're filled with that helps us along the way to become more like Jesus Love is more than just saying niceties to one another. Love is manifest by getting into the Word and growing in our knowledge and understanding. I put a, I put a challenge out to my family just yesterday. My son was leaving for his first job. Pray for my son Noah as he goes to Memphis and begins his first kind of adult job teaching in the inner city. I told him a story about when I was in high school and moment that changed my life the year before my senior year it wasn't in a church service it was by my bed in my room and I got with God and I said Lord I don't want to be an undercover Christian like I was the first three years of school I want to I want to live for you and I made a a commitment that I would read one proverb every day with wisdom wisdom is all about your character there's 31 days in every month or most months and there's 31 proverbs so whatever day it is Just take that day. So yesterday we read Proverbs 10, and today we'll read Proverbs 11. Just do that every day of the month. And I would just journal about it at night, and I would just let God just start working on my character. Oh, Lord, I'm not like this. Help me, Lord, to be more like what you're talking about here. It's manifest. The fruit of our salvation is the character that's produced in our lives. By Jesus Christ. So what does it mean? He calls us saints. He's saying that the process that you're in is becoming who you already are. When you're saved, you're already a saint. And the rest of your life, you are going to be becoming who you already are. He already sees you that way. He already sees you in all of your imperfections and flaws. He sees you through the blood of Jesus. He sees you through his grace. He sees you through his goodness. And the rest of your life is about letting that holiness work in you that he who began this good work in you is going to carry it on to completion. Do we love Jesus more than we love the world? Do we love God more than we love this culture? I mentioned that this book is about maturity. Maturity is living our lives in a way that brings glory to God. The conference didn't start until Tuesday night, and my brother lives in Houston, and so I was staying with him, and I was studying this on Tuesday before the conference started in his living room, and I got to this part of the passage where it said that our lives might bring glory to God And I just had church in my brother's living room because I remembered an old song. Let me get a microphone there. I'll take the other one if you want. You you might not want to admit you know this song because if you know this song, it means you're old. (laughs) But 
maybe there'll be a recognition. Do you, have you ever heard this song? In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified, yeah, yeah. In my life, Lord, be. So I just said, church. You know what my greatest fear is? To bring reproach on the name of Jesus. I don't want to be involved in some scandal that makes people turn away from Jesus. I want to live my life not perfectly. Well, I want to, <laughs> but I don't. But I want to live my life in a way that brings glory to Jesus in a way that people say, you know what? I want to react to stuff the way that they react to stuff. I don't want to get in the social media fights like everyone else does. Amen. I want to be different in this generation. I don't want to let the devil yank my chain and everything else. No, I want my life to bring glory to God. In my, would you stand? Life, Lord, be glorified. 